A new stay-at-home order takes effect today all across Ontario and is expected to last for at least the next four weeks. The provincial government directive has shut down many businesses and retailers and limits the size of indoor and outdoor gatherings. The order comes as case numbers in Ontario hover around 3,000 per day. Here in Thunder Bay, health officials are still trying to contain outbreaks at nursing homes and correctional facilities, all while trying to continue with the vaccine rollout. Dr. Janet DeMille is the medical Medical Officer of Health for the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, and she joins us on the line this morning. Dr. DeMille, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Amy. So let's talk about the new stay-at-home order for the province. When it was when it came out yesterday, there was, I think, fair to say, a lot of confusion, a lot of questions around the number of exceptions. Did you feel that sense of confusion yesterday? Um, well, to be honest, yes. It, it, the way uh, it was presented at the news conference uh, the previous day, uh, at the same time that the Premier announced the, the state of emergency, um, uh, it sort of suggested or implied something that was a bit stronger, and then uh, some of the messaging that came out yesterday um, seemed to water that down or, or was not as strong. I think the main message that people need to realize is that, you know, this virus is spreading and it's spreading through interactions that we have as individuals with one another and that it's really important to minimize those interactions. And one of the ways we do that very successfully is when we're, we, we stay at home and only leave our homes for essential reasons. And that does include sort of work and, and going, you know, to get food, for example, and, and various other things. Um, and I, I, so I, I, I would just encourage people to sort of understand the intention behind that yeah. and perhaps not get too confused by the messaging. But I mean, we have people being told not to leave for essential reasons, but also non-essential businesses can be open for curbside pickup. Is there a contradiction there? Um, well, uh, in some ways, yes. Uh, and it depends on, you know, you can always sort of come up with different scenarios where it sort of seems reasonable and other scenarios where it seems like a contradiction. But uh, I think they, you know, they're, you know, businesses in general can be open for curbside pickup and there's safe interactions as long as certainly the people that are working in that particular business are, are being very mindful because we know that the virus can spread among workers in any type of workplace, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it limits the interactions with customers and with the broader public, which can reduce overall interactions. But um, yeah, there is, I, I totally agree. It, it is hard to communicate. It's hard to sort of message. And I think what they try to do sometimes is balance uh, um, not shutting down everything completely, but t- still giving people access to the things while, while at the same time trying to reduce overall interactions. Well, how would you define essential? How would you clarify that for people? Um, well, I mean, ultimately, uh, sometimes what defines essential is what gets written in the legislation and regulations. So I think it's important for businesses that, you know, um, to look at the regulations because what they have to do what's in those regulations. And I just want to be mindful by my comments. I think, you know, there's obvious stuff that's essential when there are things that people need, uh, you know, the food, pharmacy, health care, uh, that's essential. Um, I think that, I mean, it's allowed for people to go outside and walk, go for a walk or go or go you know cross-country skiing or snowshoeing um, because I guess in, in that understanding exercise is essential. I know that um, if you're supporting somebody else, for example, an elderly parent uh, who lives alone or, or, or a couple, you know, your parents live somewhere and you are their caregiver and go to their house to drop off things, I think that that would be considered essential. But, um, you know, still being mindful, of course, of, the, you know, the interaction that you might have with your parents at that particular time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is one question we actually got from a listener. They were wondering about, can an adult child come and help their, their elderly parents, for example? So you would say that is okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that. Again, I think we have to be mindful of what, I mean, and I believe that will still be considered. I think that is actually in the regulations, actually. Um, and, and what we're going to be doing as a health unit, of course, is, I mean, we, we do review, same what we've always done with business and other types of regulations, is we'll review them and sort of support an understanding of what that means. So watch out for that as we as we get out messaging around that. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, there are several ongoing outbreaks in the city. One of the, the largest at this point is at the district to jail. Yeah. Uh, so we know that that is a facility that has issues with crowding. What is the greatest challenge that you're facing in managing the outbreak at that facility? Um, well, it is a, it is challenging. Uh, I mean, the physical facility itself, uh, the number of people, the the type of you know, it's a, a place where people are essentially incarcerated or held, you know, um, and uh, just the limitations in in the physical. Um, place in terms of um, being able to isolate people and separate people when they need to be. And then, of course, some of them do get uh, released, and, and we, we do follow people in the community, and we want to make sure that they have a safe place to go and, and to help them manage in the community. And some individuals are, are more vulnerable and, and have more um, uh, more needs around that. So it is, um, and then, of course, just, just managing it. We really want to stop the spread of the virus, and, uh, you know, it, it, in this case, it really it had spread before those initial cases were were picked up and we did a broader surveillance test with testing of, of a broader number of people which showed uh, the, the you know a, a larger number of people that were actually infected so you know it is really um, a lot of the same outbreak measures we would do in any type of situation and really you know working with with the correctional facility and the ministry of uh, the solicitor general to to work through to problem solve to um, you know, we've done inspections. We just to look at how we can uh, uh, imp- imp- implement those outbreak control measures and manage and enhance them as we go forward. Does the outbreak there, does it make vaccinating inmates and correction staff a higher priority? You know, I, I think uh, it makes the importance of vaccination overall a higher priority. Um, you know, there are populations in our area that are more vulnerable. I mean, we've certainly seen that with long-term care home. Well, the correctional population or the population in corrections is also, um, you know, a more vulnerable population. And, uh, you know, it's comp- in this case comp- um, compounded by the, the, by the physical structure that is, that is even more challenging. Uh, and there's other vulnerable populations and I, I, as we, and I, I heard General Hillier and, and what you just presented, I mean, we are planning uh, the vaccine rollout in our area and certainly identifying where those vulnerable populations are, who they are, uh, and then getting the vaccine to them as soon as we reasonably can. Well, we have heard that vaccinations uh, are expected to start at long-term care facilities. I know the hope was for this week. What is the plan there? So we have been actively working on uh, with the hospital and our long-term care partners on being able to take the, 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 the vaccine into the homes and immunizing the residents. And that, uh, that plan is actively unfolding this week and is anticipated to start tomorrow, actually, with, uh, um, with one home, uh, a smaller home that we can just uh, make sure all the logistics are working. It is actually really complicated, and this has unfolded really um, quickly. I just want to acknowledge acknowledge the, the hard work done by the long-term care homes themselves and by the hospital and my own team around getting this ready to go. And uh, we are going to quickly move forward as, you know, um, as able to uh, immunize. Currently, uh, the significant limitation is the supply of vaccine. And so right now, um, when we go into the homes, we're targeting the resident vaccines, we, um, vaccines to the residents. We can't really go past that at the present time because of the number of vaccines we actually have. Mm. So how do you make the decisions then about which facilities you'll go to first? So um, uh, we, I mean, we had to, I mean, there's a number of, of, of um, uh, determinations on that. We chose to start off with uh, smaller ones just so that we can ensure that the logistics are working. It, it is a complicated process. It does involve the long-term care home, the hospital, and us 
uh, being a part of it. Uh, there's data management issues, like all the niggly little things that come up in this kind of a process, and we're doing it, of course, for the first time. Even removing the the, the, the vaccine from the hospital site because it's a logist, you know, challenges with that particular vaccine. But um, and we also, uh, my own team, for example, here had an understanding of homes that we might have deemed an in particular risk or higher risk for certain reasons, uh, including the, the sort of physical structures of, of these of places, and also. Um, uh, yeah, those were there was a number of, of determinations, but also how do they fit into the schedule? And, and some of the homes are larger, where you know it does take more staffing resources and um, um, you know planning to be able to get in. Mm-hmm. So many things to consider, and on top There's of a that, lot, yeah, yeah, on yeah. top of that, as we've discussed, you've got the you're trying to communicate with people to get the the right messages out. We know that people here are are tired. People have expressed frustration with the ongoing regional approach to, or the rather the province-wide approach to restrictions. Uh, Finally, Dr. DeMille, what is your message to people at this point? Uh, Hang in there. Uh, You know what? This um, This is a horrible time. It has huge impacts. I recognize that. It has impacts on people, on families, uh, on businesses. Uh, you know, it, it is uncomfortable, and we've been in this for a long time, and it's draining, and it's impacted our lives. You know, a lot of stuff that used to be normal, we just can't do right now. And, you know, this is about, you know, people's mental health, the economy. It's about our, our children being able to safely go to school. Like, this is, uh, these are difficult times, and I I, I, uh, you know, I, I can appreciate that, and I've, I've heard that. Uh, but this is also maybe the worst of it right now, and uh, this is the time that viruses like COVID tend to are stronger. They tend to circulate. We see flu at this time every year, not this year. Um, this, this is a virus that's circulating. It's getting out of control in other places um, where there's been dramatic increases in numbers. And unfortunately, we're at risk, even though we've generally done well, we're at risk. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I do understand why these measures need to be in place right now. And I am really hopeful that those measures um, will, will reduce viral, you know, the, the, the rates of this virus across the province and in other jurisdictions outside. Um, uh, and uh, the low rates of virus actually help keep us safe, will help businesses be open or open sooner, will help the healthcare system, will help vulnerable populations like we just talked about. Um, and we will get through this. And, and the vaccine is, is here. It's coming. We're going to be protecting priority populations, but it will roll out. This is the worst of it. And I, I will commit, I, um, you know, I will commit to being an advocate for our area to open up when we're able to open up safely and where, you know, we're not, we're not going to relapse, right? Uh, I mean, we have to do that safely. And I, I do have opportunities to provide that input. They don't necessarily take my input, but I, I will do that. And we'll get through this. And honestly, we'll look forward. Even in a few months, things will be so much better. As always, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us, Dr. DeMille. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Dr. Janet DeMille is the Medical Officer of Health for the Thunder Bay District Health Unit.